Hello everybody and thanks to organize to invite me to give this presentation. I am Alice Valentini from SpyGen in France and in my talk I will present some examples on how eDNA can be used for rare species detection and biodiversity monitoring. SpyGen is a mission-led company founded in 2011. We were the first private laboratory in the world to offer eDNA expertise, and since 2018, we have labelized B Corp. But what is environmental DNA or eDNA? eDNA refers to the DNA that can be extracted from environmental samples, such as soil, water, air, feces, honey, whatever that can be collected in the field without uh, first isolating any target organism. It's characterized by the complex mixture of DNA from different organisms and can contain cellular DNA coming from living cell or organisms such as diatoms or extracellular DNA resulting from natural cell death and subsequent destruction of the cell structure. Environmental DNA was used for the species detection of microorganisms since the 70s, but it was used for the first time for macroorganisms in 2008 in this article of Fisetula and colleagues. In this article, the authors collect a water sample and detect the DNA of an invasive species in France, the American bullfrog. When using eDNA, there are two main approaches, the single species detection, also called eDNA barcoding, and the multi-species detection, eDNA metabarcoding. For both methods, the first step of the workflow are the same. We go on the field, in this case a river, and we collect an environmental sample. In this case, we filter uh, some liter of water uh, through a filtration cartridge. We go back to the lab and we extract this DNA. But the two approach different on the way of this DNA is analyzed. In eDNA barcoding, a species specific primer were designed for a target species. And the DNA is amplified using a PCR, a qPCR or a digit droplet PCR. The, the, the results of the amplification is then analyzed, for example, on agarose gel for the PCR, and a present absence of the species is determined. Uh, in some cases where we analyze a species with a, a high amount of DNA in the environment, is it possible to determine uh, the quantity of this DNA using a qPCR or a digital droplet PCR? This approach was used, for example, for the detection of great crested newt in United Kingdom, where this species is protected. In this study, we compared the performance of an eDNA barcoding approach with three different traditional surveys for this species, torch counting, bottle trapping, and visual egg search. For doing this, 35 pounds were the species was known to be present when sampled, and the survey was done four times in the same year. What we see that in all the cases but one, eDNA perfectly detected the crested newt, and this was not the case of traditional survey. To achieve the same detection probability of eDNA, two traditional survey results should be combined. Even more, on 239 sites around the country, an eDNA survey was made by volunteers not trained or supervised. 91% of the sites were correctly identified as supporting nudes, and this result did not differ if the eDNA survey was made by volunteers or a trained ecologist, opening the possibility to use eDNA for citizen science. Environmental DNA barcoding was also used to monitor in African clouded frog, Xenopus levis, in France. Xenopus levi is principally an aquatic amphibian that was introduced in several countries from South Africa. In France, due to elusive nature of the species, 
no systematic survey was done recently of the invasion range. The species using eDNA was detected well behind the formerly no invasive distribution, and it was also found behind the Loire River that was considered as a natural barrier for the expansion of the species before this study. This approach can be used for the detection of one species, but it can be also be used for the detection of its pathogen. For example, in this paper that we made in collaboration with CEF of the University of Montpellier, we collected a water sample from a small alpine lake in different period of uh, an outbreak of ranavirus before during and after the mass mortality of tadpoles. And using environmental DNA, it was possible to detect the presence of the virus before the outbreak of the infection and before the mass mortality of the tadpoles. For the second approach, the amplification strategy is different. In this case, instead of the use of species-specific primers, we will use universal primer specific for a taxonomic group such as fish, amphibia, mammals, and so on. The amplification product is then sequenced using a next-generation sequencing technology, and the sequence obtained were compared to a reference database of sequence. At the end, we will have a list of taxa present in the location. This approach was used in France for the detection of amphibian species in the Mediterranean pond. In this study, we validate the eDNA metabarcoding method for amphibian detection by comparing our result with several historical data and by the result obtained by traditional survey made in parallel, composed by amphibian catch using a mesh and net, visual and control survey, and colon survey. The number of species detected per site using eDNA was identical or higher than conventional survey method in all cases. Even more, we demonstrated that using traditional method, four visits would be necessary to obtain a similar detectability obtained with a single eDNA survey. When using eDNA barcoding approach, we can only find the species that we are looking for because we use species specific primer. But the eDNA metabarcoding is approached without any a priori knowledge of the species likely to be present in a sample ecosystem. So this may end in some nice surprise. For example, in this study that we did in collaboration with Fapesme Brazil, a Brazilian frog believed to be extant for more than 50 years were found in our eDNA testing. The missing frog DNA was detected in the Atlantic forest biome in Parque Nacional de Serra de Bucaina, the last known habitat in São Paulo state. But the performance of eDNA survey can be comparable with those than traditional survey in all the cases. In this article, the authors made a meta-analysis on more than 500 papers on eDNA. This meta-analysis was composed by papers on both eDNA barcoding, eDNA metabarcoding approach, and on several taxonomic groups ranging from microorganisms, vertebrates, and invertebrates. In this meta-analysis, it was found that in most of the cases, eDNA survey is cheaper than traditional method. And this is also what we found in our study. For example, for Great Crested Newt in UK, the use of eDNA is 10 times cheaper than traditional method. In France, for the detection of American bullfrog, it's 2.5 times cheaper. In tropical forests, for the evaluating terrestrial mammal diversity, the use of eDNA will be 2 times cheaper for small mammals and 3 times compared with camera trapping. In most of the cases, the species detected and the sensitivity was equal or higher using eDNA than traditional methods. As for example, in this study, where we describe the fish biodiversity of the Rhone River using eDNA metabarcoding approach. We collect water sample in 2016 along the Rhone River from the French border to the Mediterranean Sea for a total of 445 km survey. We collect water sample 
every 10 km for a total of 59 stations, and we collect two water samples per station for a total of 12 days of sampling. The number of species detected in using eDNA metabar coding for fish in the Rhone River were compared with the number of species caught at each station with electrofishing during the year survey. Also, all the species detected in those sites during 10 years survey were compared with the number of species detected with eDNA. The number of species detected with eDNA, represented by red square in the, in the graph, were higher than the number of species detected using electrofishing each year, represented by blue dots in the graph. When comparing the species richness detected with eDNA with the 10-year survey, represented by blue triangle in the graph, it is possible to see that with only two samples of eDNA, we can have the same species richness detected on 10 years of electrofishing. Two species were only detected by environmental DNA, the Zinger asper and Misgurnus fossilis, two critically endangered species. The Zinger asper is a species endemic to the Rhone River basin, but it was never detected again in the Rhone River before this study. When plotting the number of sequences obtained for each species, along the longitudinal gradient of the Rhone River, it was possible to see the migration front of different species, for example, European eel and alosa species in this case. And it was possible to see that the migration of eel have started before the migration of alosa when we did the sampling in the Rhone. However, if we come back to the meta-analysis, it is possible to see that not in all the cases eDNA perform better than traditional survey. It should be noted that all the eDNA should not be considered as the same. I will explain. Uh, and in this article is quite illustrative of what is composed the eDNA mixture. So uh, the author go to the to the bay in Australia collect a water sample and the sequence all the DNA was present in the samples. So what they found is the majority of the sequence uh, obtained were not possible to be assigned. That means that no sequence were present in the reference database to possibly assign the sequence and know which species was. On the species that were possible to be assigned, the extreme majority was bacterial DNA. And from the okerotic DNA that was found, very few portion was DNA from fish species. So they obtained 22 million of sequence, and of these 22 million sequence, only three sequence were fish DNA. So in the complex mixture that is eDNA, not all the species have the same quantity of eDNA. So, depending on the species that we want to analyze and the main goal of our study, the requirement of the experiments and the analysis should be adapted to be sure that they do the target group. This in terms of sampling strategy, laboratory protocol, marker choice, or laboratory facilities. For example, it's not the same to do an analysis for diatom biomonitoring than to do monitoring rare and treated species. For example, in this study that we did in collaboration with the University of Lausanne, only 50 milliliters of water were collected on pond around Europe. This quantity of water were enough for the detection of invasive mosquito species and to describe the geographic distribution of these species. But when a pond is colonized, uh, the, the density of mosquito larvae can be really huge. So the quantity of DNA present in this water can be also very high. But this is not always the case. For example, for uh, the, the description of fish biodiversity in a river and in lakes, the number of samples should be increased. All these studies demonstrate that the 
volume of water that is collected in a lake or in a river should be increased up to a dozen or liter of water if we want to well describe the fish biodiversity in, on those sites. This is especially true when we are looking for forel species. For example, in this article, the authors looked for the detection of vertebrate species in streams. So they collect water sample and they calculate the number of samples needed for the detection of fish and for mammals and for birds. So what they found that the sampling effort to detect the rare species, in this case the mammals, should be increased comparing to the common species. In this case, it was the fish ones. This is, is also true on marine environment, where the species density can be lower in some case than the one founded in river on lakes. In these two studies, we evaluate the number of samples that needed to accurately estimate the fish biodiversity using environmental DNA in coral reef in several regions around the globe. The two studies have the same eDNA laboratory analysis, but they differ on sampling strategy. In the first paper, several two liters of sample were collected, where in the second one, the sampling strategy was to collect an integrative sample of 30 liters. Both papers arrive at the same conclusion on the volume of water to be collected. However, in the first one, the number of samples to be analyzed is much higher. It is important to consider that the DNA is not homogeneously distributed over the environment, and the DNA of a species tends to stay close to each source, as demonstrated by these two articles. For example, in lakes, the carp DNA was only found where the population was present and not where the population was absent, for example, in the central lakes. In river samples, the DNA tend to be transported on a linear way. And so it is important to take this in consideration if you want to detect a rare species. So it's important to have uh, collect several samples along a grid or a gradient or to make an integrative sample over space. After its release, the DNA start to degrade. So at the beginning, we have DNA with a high quantity and high quality. But over time, this DNA starts to fragmentize with the smaller and smaller fragments that were present in the environment. So at the beginning, after its release, we can use long DNA region as a target to detect the species. But if we want to increase the detection of rare species, markets that amplify small DNA fragments should be selected as demonstrated by these two studies. Both studies evaluate the performance of different markers for fish biodiversity assessment using eDNA metabarcoding on freshwater environment and marine environment. Both studies arrive at the same conclusion that with the primers that amplify the smallest fragment detect more species. However, small fragments have less species resolution than local fragment. And we demonstrate that the combination of two markers results in an increased species detectability. So once we have all the requirements needed in mind, eDNA can be a very powerful tool for species monitoring, especially for elusive species such as mammals. For example, in this study, we collect water samples along three rivers in French Guiana, from the mount to the closest achievable point to their sources. We use exactly the same protocol that we use for the fish biodiversity assessment in the Rhone rivers. And at this time, we look for mammalian biodiversity. Different species of mammal were found in the three different rivers, and the species distribution was then described on different emblematic species with manatine and cetacea only found in the estuary sample of the rivers. Looking at the species distribution, it was also possible to correlate the species detection with human presence and activity. With species like capybara and kinkajou, two generalist species that are not hunted by human, 
were found spread all over the river samples. Other species are impacted by human. For example, the vulnerable species, uh, giant otter, neotropical otter and spider monkey, were found far from a human settlement, with only an exception of spider monkey that was found close to Troisseau, a compi village. But this DNA can be come from animal hunter far away, brought back and butchered in those villages because the spider monkey is eaten by humans in French Guiana. But all the potential of eDNA come when we are dealing with species that are very difficult to inventory uh, using traditional method. This is the case for freshwater bivalves. Bivalves are a very important bioindicator group, but they are difficult to find due to the environment where they live, their size, their ecology. Traditional survey need long prospection made by expert malacologists that need a special equipment and special license to dive in rivers. Even more, once collected in the field, the species need to be identified by an expert taxonomist. And expert taxonomists on the, this field are very rare. For example, for spheridae species in France, only one person is capable to distinguish them based on their morphology. To overcome all this limitation, we developed in 2019 an environmental DNA metabarcoding approach for biodiversity assessment of freshwater bivalves. We validated this approach over 300 sites around France and we also compare the results over 15 sites where EDNA was done in parallel with traditional surveys. In all the sites where we compared EDNA results with traditional survey results, EDNA detect more species than the traditional survey. This is especially true for the two sites of Jesur Mose and Samiel, where several aspheridid species were found that were not easily identifiable using traditional survey. In only one site, traditional survey detect more species than eDNA. However, in this site, only empty shell of these two species were detected. And thus, eDNA results confirm that no living animal were present in the seed anymore. This study also increased the knowledge that we had for invasive species. For example, Euglesa compressa. It's a, a North American species that was recently found as an invasive in France. This species was first described in France from genetic evidence in 2017 and first detected using eDNA in 2016. This map represented the distribution of the species all uh, over France, with the black dot is are the detection made using traditional surveys and the stars are the detection made using environmental DNA. And what we can saw that using environmental DNA, we can see that the species is much more spread than pre previously thought. This is, is also the case for quagga mussels. In 2017, quagga mussel was describing French river using a combination of traditional surveys, the orange dot on the map, and the eDNA uh, analysis, the red dot in the map. And it was making the hypothesis that the invasion front was expanding from the north to the south of France. But with the survey made it between 2006 and 2019 uh, using environmental DNA metabarcoding for bivalves, we demonstrate that this species was more spread than previously thought. With rivers such as Meuse and Rhone, they were completely colonized by the species. The use of environmental DNA metabarcoding for freshwater bivalves biodiversity assessment 
greatly increase the knowledge of these species around France and affect the use of these techniques, resulting in a significant increase in spherids data collected in the French National Inventory of Natural Heritage Database. For, as we can see in this graph with the its made by traditional survey in blue and with the event of eDNA that we increase seven times more the data collected just with traditional survey. In this presentation, I show how with eDNA is possible to monitor a single species, such as great crested newt in UK, or a group of species like freshwater bivalve in France. But with a single environmental DNA sample, it is possible to study different groups in parallel. This is the case, for example, for the Rhone River sample collected in 2016. The same DNA extracted was used for assess fish biodiversity and after two years for freshwater biodiversity assessment. When using a standardized method uh, for eDNA analysis, it is possible to collect the DNA again in the same location after a certain period to compare the results in order to see what was the evolution of biodiversity over time. For example, we collect the eDNA sample on the Rhone River in 2016, on the Maroni River in 2017, and we will go back to those river uh, in November for the Maroni River and next year for the Rhone River. The results of the study that I presented here and the, the scientific expedition we conduct around the world on several rivers and marine environment validated the technology that will be deployed on the Global Life Observatory, VigiLife. VigiLife is a global network for monitoring biodiversity based on standardized eDNA method. It will be a long-term monitoring of thousands of sites around the world. This global monitoring will be made thanks to standardized eDNA data that will fit national and international database, including the VigiLife Map platform in accordance with territories and Nagoya protocol. A rapid capacity building in territories that want to be part of VigiLife initiative will be made possible thanks to laboratories that will guarantee the quality of the analysis and the protection of manipulator and the environment. For example, the first eDNA mobile laboratory will be installed in Invemar, Colombia at the beginning of the next year, also thanks to the financial help of the French government. In order to deploy or consolidate long-term ecosystem monitoring networks on a global scale, the VigiLife Observatory is based on the development and implementation of scientific program to structure cooperation between the various partners of the territories around a specific theme. For example, the Sentinel Rivers and the Sentinel Marine Area. This program are the results of a rigorous collaborative process based on a co-construction from the beginning of their design between scientific research partners and stakeholders, such as companies, natural area management, and non-government organization or public institution. And thanks for your attention.